I would like to welcome everybody to our regular uh, uh, Nursi Society uh, webinars. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Nas Nasreen Rosati. Let me just say a few things uh, about her. She holds a bachelor degree in broadcast journalism and master's in educational technology. And her PhD is in Islamic studies from the University of Durham, UK. <laughs> Along with uh, having a full-time career as a director of technology for New York school districts, Dr. Rosati joined the Department of Religious Studies at Manhattan College, New York in 2007. And while a part-time faculty member in 2018, she was promoted to associate professor position. So Dr. Rosati has taught world religion courses and currently teaches two upper class courses in on Islam. And some of her areas of interest include Quranic studies, Islamic theology, Islamic mysticism, theodicy, and comparative theology. And uh, we are also happy to say that she is also participating in some of the projects that uh, Nursi Society is working on. Inshallah, we'll continue our collaboration in future also. Dr. Rosati's book, Trial and Tribulations in the Quran, A Mystical Theodicy, her book that is uh, published in 2015, and the topic is obviously related to what she is going to be discussing today. And she is also the author of other scholarly articles in the area of Islamic studies. So today's uh, discussion is entitled, Evil, and human suffering in Islamic thought towards a mystical theodicy. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce her and welcome her. Please, uh, Dr. Zati, uh, you can start your uh, talk. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Salam alaikum. It's good morning for me from New York. Um, it is good afternoon for you guys. Salam alaikum, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. I am um, truly delighted um, to be with you today. Um, as you know, the topic of our discussion today is about uh, a very important topic that um, everyone goes through in, in our human experience, meaning experiencing um, you know, suffering, hardships, difficulties. And <clears throat> this is uh, basically umbrella under evil, the issue of evil and human suffering. And, I'll be talking about um, an overview, basically, of uh, Islamic um, perspective. Um, so as you know, the problem of evil, as it is um, referred to mostly in the literature in the West, and sometimes actually is referred mostly to the cause of human suffering, is uh, perhaps one of the most debated questions in the history of philosophy of religion. Uh, it's a very um, heated discussion. Um, and of course, um, you know, in the context of the monotheistic religions, this issue gains particular attention because it claims to bring into question the uh, main pillars, basically, of those religions, uh, namely the existence of a very powerful God who at the same time is ultimately compassionate and ultimately merciful. Um, when we um, study the Odyssey in, in, in the Western world, we see that the term uh, evil appears a lot, of course, and the meaning of that is mostly assumed, is um, not really negotiated. Um, mostly you will see in literature personal loss, um, you know, illnesses, violence, even natural disasters, all of these are umbrella under the term evil. So in attempt to shed light on the topic as it has been uh, treated mostly in, in Islamic thought or Muslim thought, uh, we will begin our journey um, from the Quran, followed by a brief discussion on the theological, philosophical, and mystical uh, perspectives. Now, as you know, all of these areas uh, really do need a dedicated webinar just to themselves. So I wouldn't be able to dive deep into any of those areas. I will be touching 
um, the surface basically on, on various um, Muslim thoughts as, as I go through the presentation. Um, so we will be uh, touching the surface on areas and hopefully at the end, we will be able to have uh, a thoughtful and fruitful um, uh, discussion. So the concept of evil um, in the Quran um, appears mostly in two distinct categories of, of, of narratives. Um, the first group are those that are falling to the semantic um, field of Shar and appear amongst the moral concepts um, of the Quran, where mostly Khair and Shar are discussed side by side. Um, and of course, the root of the moral concept uh, or ethical values of the Quran is really dependent upon um, the, the portrait that the Quran paints for us as far as the relationship between God and man or God and humankind is, is concerned. So uh, mostly the notions of the fact that the whole creation, the whole creation is, um, is purposeful and human creation is purposeful uh, and not, and not in vain. If you could, uh, have everyone muted, please? There's a lot of background. Thank you. Um, so again, I was saying that moral concept of the Quran really bases itself on the God, God man's relationship, which is based on different notions such as the whole creation particularly man's creation is purposeful and not in vain. And the notion that man has been designed as God's representative on earth. So all of these are the base for the moral concept of the Quran. So when evil then, or share is presented as a moral concept, uh, for the most part, it refers to situations or conditions that um, man basically creates for him. Um, how does um, you know, man manage to do that? This is when... Um, Hakan, Hakan, if you as a, as a co-host, if you just put everyone... Uh, yeah, in, yeah. yeah uh, everybody, I am unwitting. Uh, so uh, when uh, Dr. Ramzati uh, finished her presentation, he uh, can ask me uh, to speak up. Okay. I see that Rafael is talking. Um, yes. We don't realize that the mic is not muted, Hakan. Yeah, I did, but then they open it, unfortunately. I think just, just a second, I will try to contact him. So um, let me uh, try to continue okay, here. Um, so um, when evil is again presented as a, you know as a moral concept, is a situation that man creates for himself. How does he do that? It is when humankind, in his own volition, with the choices that he makes, adapts to certain behavior or certain conducts that is not in accord with the divine plan, such as the purpose of his creation. So when he decides to deviate from the path that it was intended for him, he's the one who's putting himself basically in the condition that refers to as shar or evil. Some of these deeds, as we can see on, on this slide, um, mostly refer to slander, unbelief, miserliness, and some of the verses of the Quran. Now this um, part of the, um, or this group of the narratives of shar was discussed by uh, Tuban Nur two weeks ago in her webinar very extensively and comprehensively. So I'm not gonna discuss this any further. This was just a way of uh, introduction, first as a review and second, just to uh, again, remind everyone that uh, the, the narratives of the Quran where Shar is discussed falls into two different categories, okay? Uh, the second group where evil is discussed in the Quran is beyond the semantic um, sort of field and is really is about uh, situations and conditions that humankind is placed or finds himself in and um, that mostly is those discussion, those um, situations are mostly undesirable, uh, unwanted. People want to 
uh, get rid of those situations, right? So this is where human suffering comes to play and we actually enter into the field of theodicy and this is what this, uh, most of this webinar is, is about, is about uh, the theodicy and uh, reflections mostly from the Muslim perspective. So the term that it is used in the Quran in this category of narratives mostly is bala or ibtila, which is loosely translated into English as trial, as tests, as challenges. The term fitna also is used in the Quran, but not as extensively as bala and, and ibtila. So these narratives, um, as you can see on this slide, I was able to put all of them uh, from the entire Quran in four um, distinct categories. And this was of course done by studying the context of each narrative, occasion of the revelation, you know, the relationship of that verse within the entire chapter, and also in cross-referencing those verses with similar verses and similar context through the, throughout the Quran. So this methodology um, usually is referred to as intra-textual interpretation where the Quran interprets itself. So some verses actually interpret other verses and then you, you form uh, an overall understanding. So by doing such a methodology, I was able to put all of those verses in four different categories that you see on the screen. Um, now, we won't have time to go all of these categories. The first category I will touch on later on um, because it's, it's the, one of the most important um, areas of uh, Iptila in the Quran, but uh, the four categories are distinct and there are some overlaps, I would say, between uh, some of them, uh, although again, they have their own distinct characteristic. What is really fascinating to me about Iptila in the Quran is that although it corresponds to human suffering, you know, adversities, illnesses, um, difficulties, but this doesn't refer to all of their verses. In fact, it has a positive connotation and it's not just in um, adversities and, and difficult times. And I will elaborate on that as, as we go through this. So a very careful examination of the Bala Ibtila narratives in the Quran seem to suggest that the problem of evil, okay, that is presented in the literature nowadays that we, we read about, and by extension, of course, human suffering is not really presented in the Quran as a problem or as a theoretical problem. It is rather as presented or highlighted or demonstrated as an instrument, okay, in the actualization of God's purpose. Most of these narratives reveal that there's an underlying rationale for the existence of various forms of uh, evil and, and human suffering. And um, basically that rationale is to put us, to put humankind into the test as trial, as test, to form a character, to build character, to, um, for us to grow as individuals on the path that we are supposed to be. So not only that, so for example, one of the um, verses you see on chapter 2, Surat al-Baghara, we shall certainly test you with fear and hunger and loss of property and, you know, talking about being steadfast. So again, this is just one example. There are a lot of examples in the Quran within the same context. So we are told that we are going to be tested with some tangible, as you can see on this verse, uh, objectives uh, as we go through trials and, and ibtilas. But more importantly than that, we have a verse in the Quran that is very eye-opening, that calls the whole creation of humankind um, um, to be created in toil and into trial. We have certainly created man for toil and trial. This is in chapter 90, verse four. So, it is stated when you study all of these narratives together, uh, you realize that you know it is part and parcel of human experience, and uh, this whole Ittila notion and the suffering that may come with it, and it is absolutely purposeful. 
um, it is purposeful and it has a positive connotation. So contrary to popular belief that when we say bala or ibtula, um, that you know in that conversation bala and ibtula is largely negative, the Quran actually shows us conversely that this terminology and this notion is multidimensional and is entirely positive. It looks upon as ways by which God's plan or purpose or his cosmic plan, the divine plan actually in the creation gets actualized, is actualized and is realized through Ibtila. And I will show you, um, you know, one of those verses. So this is, if you remember the four categories that I uh, briefly talked about on two slides before, we said there were four categories. The first one has to do with those groups of narrative that Ibtula is considered as a main pillar in the, structural, in, in the structure of the creation of the universe. And this is extremely eye-opening for all of us. We may have read all of us these verses you know, um, and, and pass by them quickly, but to actually stop and ponder about them. It is he who created the heavens and the earth. Okay, so the creation of the entire cosmos, right? In six days and his throne was on water, so as to test you, which one of you does best. The term that is used in this verse is liablovannakum which is from Bala and Itula. Why? Because ayyukum ahsanu amala. So that you'll know which one of you does best, right? And there's a lot of interpretation about God knows what we do, so why is he testing us? That's not our discussion here. That's for a different discussion. The point that I'm trying to make is that the whole creation of the heavens and the earth is based on Ibtula, therefore it cannot be negative, it is wholly positive. Right? Our conducts, our behavior are being evaluated through the Ibtulas, through these hardships. The second one in Surat Al-Kah, we have adorned the earth with attractive things so that we may test people to see or to show which one of them do best. Again, the term is And again, these are just examples. There are many, many different examples from the Quran that actually creation of death, you know, maut, maut al hayat, death and, 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 and life in Surah al Mulk is discussed as creation so that it's extremely eye-opening to see that Ibtula is really 100% um, purposeful and, and positive. So when we gain this overall understanding, okay, from the term Ibtula, what we are uh, coming to terms with is that uh, one may argue actually that the purposefulness of human suffering the fact that Ibtula is positive, right? And it is the, as part of the creation of the universe, right? That we just saw on a couple of verses, uh, you know, and, and the role that it plays in the divine plan, it would give us two important corollaries, right? Uh, two um, results, basically. The first corollary is that there is no contradiction then between God's attribute of omnipotent, that powerful God, and the fact that evil and human suffering exist, which is again, is the focus of the uh, field of theodicy, right? There is no contradiction. We just saw that the Quran tells us, I, the Lord, am doing this for a purpose. Therefore, what contradiction are we talking about, right? So that's the first, uh, one may argue this might be the first corollary or, or result that we gain from this. Moreover, since God is certainly in, in control of his creation, uh, according to many, many, many verses in the Quran, one I have on this slide, right? You elevate whoever you will, you humble whoever you will. All that is good lies in your hands, right? So this verse, and again, many other verses point to the fact that contrary to what may seem on the forefront, on the surface, you know, we may see a lot of 
um, you know, chaos in the world. But in fact, according to the Quran, the, the world or the universe is moving towards the goal, the purpose that Allah has for it, even though it may seem a little, um, you know, again, uh, on the surface, may, may, you may feel that it's not so. So, you know, in the fact that God is in control of the creation, then suffering, of course, uh, must be allowed by him, which again points us back to the purposefulness and, and the whole idea of having a purpose and an instrumentality of Iptila in the whole um, divine plan. Now, the second, um, you know, corollary is that if suffering is a test, if we go through Iptila and we are actually actualizing the purpose for the whole creation, and if it's regarded as a necessary component, right, of the whole life that we have on this earth, then we must look uh, on the other side of this coin and find out what is expected of, of humankind. The expectation that the Quran has is not to get involved into abstract sort of um, discussion, more about, okay, what do you do or how do you handle when you go to uh, the Iptala to change our mindset, to give us more uh, actual practices and guidelines to go through the Iptala and realize the what's behind the surface really looking to um the uh, you know beneath what we see the surface so it appears that the quran again looking at all of the verses that any kind of hardship not just iptala perhaps zara ba'asa all of those terminologies and all of those um contexts in the quran that points to um hardship and suffering what the Quran wants us to do is to look at these situations and conditions as opportunities to actualize our inner potentials. So when man does that, when we change our mindset and we have a different reflection upon iptila and, and, and suffering, what we actually are doing is through the process, we are becoming who we are in our essence, right? We have been created as God's representative on earth, but are we really or not depends on how we choose to lead our lives, right? The, the years that we are on this earth, how many years um, it's in our taqdeer. So um, it, it is important then for man or for humankind to change his perspective on Iptila and sort of um, decontrast, you know, the iptila, the negative meaning of iptila that uh, we have been so accustomed to. So um, this is really important to, to realize. What is quite interesting and again fascinating to me, which I alluded before, is that even though um, iptila in the Quran points to and corresponds to some challenges and some adverse adversities, but equally so, and equally importantly, it actually points to when everything is good, when we are prosperous, when we have health, when we are in contentment, when we have abundance. It's not, it's not just about um, adversities. It's not just about hardship. It's quite interesting that Iptula or all of the tests that we go through is really in health and well-being and, and equally. Um, you know, in, in both, which is something that, um, uh, you know, it, it's hardly talked about. Always Iptula is negative. Um, and, and so this, this new understanding hopefully will give us a deeper dive into this. And I have two verses as an example. We shall test you all through the bad and the good. This is in Surat al -Anbiya. So we, we, we definitely would be tested. So when we have health, what are we doing when we are healthy? When we have wealth, what is it that we are doing with that wealth, right? And when we don't have it, how are we dealing with it? So both conditions, both are uh, trial and test. And Surah Al-Fajr, chapter 89, I have a few um, summaries of these verses here. The verses are, are much more than this. The slides didn't have enough uh, space. If you haven't looked at it, 
uh, please take a look at it from this from this perspective when his lord tries man through blessings again the term that is used is bala when his lord tries him tests him through blessings so blessing is there there's not a problem there is no adversity he says oh my lord has honored me but when he tries him through restriction of his provision he says oh my lord has humiliated me Kalla, no indeed you did not we do not honor orphan we do not urge one another to feed the poor you love wealth with a passion Jamma, the Quran calls it. And there are other verses. So basically, these um, verses point to the fact that in every single situation, whether good or bad, whether health or illness, whether in prosperity or whether in lack of that, all is test. Every condition that we, we live in is test, is iptula, and it is supposed to move us and towards um, better understanding of our responsibility now in the quran one of the um, you know really great examplars that displays this it both prosperity and and illness is prophet job of course the quran talks about more than 25 uh, prophets who have been through many many trials and i have a whole chapter on prophets in the book but here i just want to point out prophet job iu because there's a distinct uh, difference about him and the, from the Quranic version and the biblical version. Uh, Prophet Job, as you know, um, was very prosperous, right? He had enormous fortune, but he never attributed the ownership to himself. He always um, was a humble servant and he always attributed everything that he had to, uh, to his Lord. And when he got tested with that serious illness, the affliction, um, he ascribed that to Satan. That if there's any feeling of despair, he, the anxiety that he, thought he was feeling, he says, oh, Lord, oh, my Lord, it's because of Satan who is trying to make me anxious or make me upset because I'm going through this. So he realizes that the test that he's going through is, is positive. Now, the story of Job in Judeo-Christian tradition has a huge difference between the Quranic version, and that is that in uh, the book of Job, as you know, the discussion is between and his friends who are trying to make sense out of this whole situation and uh, Job actually challenges God he's asking God why are you doing this to me what have I done which was wrong in the Quranic version there is none of that right um, there is no challenge he does not question God he goes through the experience and therefore in the Quran this this narrative is, is about a reward narrative and at the end of the uh various verses that uh story of ayub is is discussed allah calls him an excellent servant because how he uh, handled both situations when he was prosperous and then when he went through the um difficult time um so now that we have a better understanding of the ibtula as far as the quran is concerned um let me briefly start to get into some of the philosophical um, theological and mystical uh, perspectives. Um, from the Muslim um, philosophical perspective, the whole notion of uh, good and evil is really enclosed within the wider ontological uh, understanding of existence, uh, which is Bujud, and non-existence, which is Adam. Now, I would like to remind everyone that two weeks ago, we heard uh, an excellent presentation from Tuvanu on this, uh, on this ontological aspect of evil so I'm not going to discuss this um, in, at length in a nutshell um, good is defined as a positive entity that branches from existence on the other on the other hand evil stems from non-existence right and therefore is viewed as negative entity now an example of this ontological ontological discussion can be seen from basically what constitutes good and what constitutes evil can be seen from the work of various philosophers, for example, Ibn Sina and uh, Mullah Sadra or Sadruddin Shirazi. So Avicenna, very quickly again, uh, was able to form an actual theodicy around evil. And the way he did that was by distinguishing or differentiating 
between various forms of evil. He discussed essential evil or shall result and compared that to accidental evil or shall arab, right? And he goes about discussing all of that in a very ontological, again, philosophical um, discussion. Now, at the end, though, he uh, concludes by saying that it is really the non-essential or the shareable arras or accidental evil that is the leading cause of human suffering. And he also affirms that the amount of good, khair, in the world outweighs um, you know, the, the amount of evil in the world. Now, Mullah Sadra also talks about this. In his view, um, absolute existence is absolute good. And of course, since God is the only entity that, you know, he's the only necessary being, then he is the absolute good. And therefore, perfection applies only to God, right? And so the rest of creation, that is all that is contingent entities, all of those, lack certain um, degree of goodness. And that's how evil is presented from his perspective. Again, the perfect perfection or the, the goodness applies only to God. Everything else in this world is contingent and therefore um, uh, lacks a certain amount of goodness, which basically means evil. And so he also concludes that evil and suffering is partial, is negative. And um, you know, again, the amount of good is much more than what we see evil. Now, I should also mention here briefly that Muslim philosophers by and large um, you know, refer to evil as privation of good, which in turn provides a, a really a strong rationale for the doctrine of the optimum or Nizam al aslah which basically talks about uh, this world, contrary to what it seems on the surface, has been created, um, you know, perfectly by a creator who is a perfect one. And therefore, the amount of human suffering and evil is really inconsequential in, uh, you know, in relation to the volume of good that is really inherent um, in the world. And that's basically, in a nutshell, what the philosophers refer to in evil uh, discussion. Now, as far as theological perspective is concerned, perhaps one of the earliest debates in Muslim theological thought or Kalam was to how to reconcile the divine attributes of omnipotent, right? Uh, again, the, the whole idea of theodicy where Allah or God is the most powerful, is all powerful, omnipotent, and the notion of human free will, right? So how do we um, reconcile between these two? Now, this seems to be the very first attempt to initiate a theodicy in the context of Islam. At the core of this debate, was the notion, of course, that God creates all acts, right? He's the only true agent in the universe. And so the debate started to uh, develop to the fact that, okay, if he's the one who creates all acts, then he must be the one who creates all evil acts, right? And therefore, what happens to the validity of human free will? And man's accountability, the divine judgment, all of those discussions, that is noted in the uh, you know, formative years of uh, Muslim theology. Um, and also whether or not um, you know, the, the two other notion that is in essence sort of related to this whole human free will and, and omnipotence of God is the fact that is man able to, um, you know, independently from revelation, um, decide or discern or understand and between that which is good and that which is bad. And of course, this again goes back to the root of intrinsic values of acts. Do certain acts in their nature actually, in their essence, are they good and some are bad in their essence? For example, when we say that telling the truth is good, why is it good? Is it good because the revelation says it's good? Or is it good because in the essence, saying and talking honestly and, and you know, saying the truth in its essence is good. So this, again, this whole discussion between theological um, uh, or Kalam schools uh, continued and, you know, 
uh, sort of started to be uh, crystallized, of course, between the uh, Mutazilid and the Ash'ari. So the Mutazilid, of course, they denied the, uh, the fact that God creates um, you know, evil acts. And the way that they do that, uh, they did that was they concentrated and maneuvered around the divine attribute of justice. God is Adil, and because he is just, he cannot create evil, right? And uh, then what is evil? It is really attributed to human free will. You know, God um, cannot, uh, in, the, in his goodness, in, the, in his essence that he's perfectly good, God cannot prevent man's freedom of choice. His whole creation is based on that, right? that. So, <laughs> so, um, so man is responsible then, um, you know, for, uh, for evil in the world and for suffering. So when they got challenged on the question, okay, then who's responsible for the suffering that is result from the disease? Obviously, no one is going to inflict themselves with disease. This comes from Allah. They, the answer was that, you know, it, that disease actually may seem on, this, on the forefront or surface as a disease or as, a, as evil, but it's actually a good that God has created because it serves a purpose. That disease has a purpose in the entire cosmic plan. So again, this seems to be the very first attempt or appearance of the theory of instrumentality of human suffering in, in the divine plan. Um, so Mutazilid, um, you know, they um, uh, consisted and insisted on, on, the, uh, on the justice, on the divine attitude of justice. And because of that, it sort of divided the group and gave rise to the Ash'arit school of thought. So from the Ash'arit uh, theology and perspective, um, God is just, yes, but God's justice of law doesn't really apply to him. Um, it only applies to human beings who are obligated to act according to his laws. Um, if you were to apply, uh, according to some of those uh, discussions, if you were to apply idea of justice to God himself, uh, you are going to put a limit on that all-powerful God. Uh, and definitely God is not bound by his own laws. So then what happens to just? Is God just? Yes, God is just, according to Ashari but he's just in whatever that he does. So if you were to apply this to suffering, right, and, he, and, and evil, this basically means that all, all harm encountered um, on human being is fair. It has been built by God who is just in his creation. Now, uh, we don't have time to discuss this right now, but of course this has a lot of, um, you know, political implications, right? Um, so, and, and as, as you know, in the history of, of um, Islam, we have seen a lot of these uh, topics being think about and being maneuvered about by, by politicians and, and by governments who were in power um, and used these ideas to do whatever that, that they wanted to. So um, again, as far as both Ash'arid and Mutazilid are concerned, one thing is clear that compensation in the next world is part of their understanding. And I, and, uh, I should also mention that animal suffering and child suffering is discussed um, in the literature, specifically by the Mu'tazilid. Um, and again, uh, this discussion is huge. This is, uh, it, it has many different um, you know, elements into it. Uh, I just have a little bit here just again to, to sort of reflect historically uh, of how this, this, this was discussed, but certainly there's a lot more to it than I have um, on this slide. So uh, moving on to the mystical perspective, um, so we've seen the logical and the theoretical discourses about evil is really discussed amongst the philosophers and, about, and amongst the, the theologians, right? However, the more practical and what I like to call existential uh, form of this concept uh, comes to life in, in teachings of the mystics. And this is where my own um, you know, understanding and my own sort of vote goes into. And I'd like to, at the end of this time, share with you some of the future developments I would like to see in the existential form of theodicy. So when we looked at the mystical perspective or the Muslim mystics, 
um, seen from their perspective overall, without even looking at one particular mystic, right? Overall, if you look at the mystical perspective, this world is a stage where all divine attributes interplay and manifest, right? In other words, everything, evil and good, including everything that goes on in this world, um, is the manifestation of a loving and powerful God who's perfect in his essence. Now, Saeed Nursi, I should mention that he has a lot to say about this. Um, his whole theology is based on divine attributes, right? And actually, I've written about this. It's, it's a, a very eye-opening that um, divine attributes and, and sefat plays a very critical um, role in um, Sai Nursi's um, theology. So again, going um, from an overall perspective, looking at the mystics from an umbrella view, um, you know, um, from a balcony view, as they say here in the West, we see that it's the divine attributes and the interplay and the manifestation of all of the divine attributes that brings this world into creation, right? So um, having that in, 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 in the back of our minds, let's take a look at Kuli Ibn Arabi, right? Ibn Arabi is unique um, in his view because when he wants to talk about um, why evil, uh, has been entered into this universe. He talks about the fact that, um, you know, first of all, from his perspective, again, um, evil is negative, is, is appeared to be, to be um, evil is not really authentic, but more importantly, from his perspective, evil or shar is not a consequence of Adam and Eve's, um, you know, sin, because they ate from that tree, okay? In fact, it is a consequence from an earlier act within the whole act of creation. And again, he's very unique in his view. And uh, the way, again, in a nutshell, I don't have time to expand on this, but the way he talks about it is that um, the essence of God is pure light, right? It's pure goodness. When God created the world, right? and all of these multiple forms of creation appeared, what actually happened in the act of creation was the creation was separated from the divine essence, from that true light. And therefore, as soon as creation happened, there is a little bit of a darkness or lack of light because creation is no longer within the essence of God, which was 100% pure light. And therefore, evil then, comes into play or shall intercede into the creation naturally. It should happen. There is no other way to have this done. And so the creation um, sort of evil is embedded in creation in the whole act of creation because it's separated from the divine essence and the true light and 100% light that it, it, that it had. So moving along, um, basing on that, we have Al-Ghazali, who actually uh, in the literature, we have a Ghazali and Saadasi. As you know, um, Ghazali talks about, um, a, has a very famous dictum, statement of the best of all possible worlds, right? He uh, went through an extraordinary mystical experience. And when he left Nizami Baghdad and he went to Syria to start practicing Sufism at that time, he um, saw, um, differently, or he gained a different kind of reflection on all of the knowledge that he had prior to that experience, right? And so um, after his experience, he writes the um, famous book of Ehyai Ulum din and in one of those books, the book of Tawakkul, he talks about best of all possible worlds. Now, even though um, in the rit literature, uh, the best of all possible world is referred to as Ghazali and Theodicy, and I actually do that myself in my own writing. But I, I really want to just point out that even though we see a lot of different elements of classical Theodicy in Ghazali's work, uh, his ideas seem to suggest that he's really trying to show the Muslims and Mu'minin, the believers, how to develop a, a more authentic trust or tawakkul in God. So whether he realized that he's actually 
writing uh, uh, classical thought is still not, I'm not 100% sure, but the fact that this dictum, this statement appears in the book of Tawakkul of Ehiya seems to suggest that his idea was about uh, providing people more insight on how to deal with issues and suffering and how to remain, um, you know, moment and have a high level of trust and God uh, in God, uh, trust in God. So um, moving on, uh, we see again, I just want to allude to say nursing for a second. Say nursing is in a unique position from my perspective because he has uh, a lot of, uh, you know, personal experience that he's shared with us. And he has gone through a lot of ibtilas, different forms of um, suffering um, that he has uh, gone through his life. And I think he's in actually a very good position to provide a lot of great uh, practical guidelines uh, for everyone, even for um, you know, the modern man who's going through digital age and has a lot of issues. So I think that uh, one of the main things that he talks about is trust in God, how to go through the pain, through these experiences, how to form sabr or patience. And he actually has treaties on uh, parents who lost, uh, you know, their child, uh, people who are going go on elderly. Um, you know, he has um, a treaty on uh, sickness, on illness. And he, again, he uh, maneuvers around the idea of this existential way of looking at things and becoming more moment and and remaining moment and 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 uh, tawakkul and trust in God. Um, Jalaluddin Rumi, um, last but not least, he also has a lot of uh, practical guidelines. What I love about Rumi is that he has a few, um, you know, uh, uh, parables, uh, poetry in in um, the Basnavi that is really um, speaks uh, at least to me, um, you know, in my own personal life, and I hope that it resonates. Uh, with all of you. One of them, um, you know, he's talking about beating a rock, right? Um, so he says that if we are beating a rock with a stick, the goal is not that we want to beat the rock, but that we want to get rid of the dust, okay? So, and I'm quoting here from him. He says, your inward is full of the dust from the veil of eyeness. Your inward is full of the dust from the veil of eyeness. And that dust will not leave all at once, right? So again, because that eyeness builds upon our character every day, uh, it's gonna take a lot of different variations of ibtila and tests for us to realize and to try to get rid of that dust within us. So the message from this parable is see beyond the surface. Don't think that God is punishing you necessarily or that you're picked upon or as we saw on um, Surat al-Fajr that God is humiliating you. No, this is all ibtila. This is our test. So see beyond the surface. The other parable that I want to quickly touch upon is the parable of the chickpea, which is extraordinary. If you haven't seen it, please and uh, take a look at it when, when you have a chance. Chickpeas, um, you know, his housewife um, buys the chickpeas, brings it to the kitchen, and it starts to boil them. And so there's a dialogue between the chickpea and the housewife. And the chickpea says that he comes up, you know, as he's being boiled, he comes up continuously and cries to the housewife and sort of nags her and, and complains and, and raises hundred cries, as, as Rumi says. And, and he says that, why are you... And setting me on fire since you bought me. How are you turning me upside down? This dialogue continues, and the housewife goes on hitting uh, the chickpea, um, you know, um, with the ladle to put it back into the boiling water. And she finally says, No, no, boil in nicely. Don't jump away from the one who makes the fire. I do not boil you because you are hateful to me. Nay, nay, it is so that you may get taste and savor. So the, again, the, the message that Rumi tries to bring, the mystical message is submit. Don't fight the challenge. This is not to say, this is not to suggest that we should not um, you know, prevent evil in the world. This is not saying that. 
but when you are encountering the message of you when we are encountering these conditions and these situations submit and learn from it so i think i'm at the end of my time um very quickly um just as a way of concluding remarks um as we saw e evil and human suffering is not portrayed in the quran as a theoretical problem it is really woven in in various contexts and various experiences that human beings have to go through and by the way like i, I think i alluded to this before it includes the prophets uh, there's a whole lot of uh, it shall all discuss within the prophet's lives that is really eye opening. And like I said, I do have a whole chapter on it shall in the lives of the prophets in the book. Uh, again, the objective of evil and human suffering is for us, for human beings, to go through the it and to realize the purpose of those challenges. Again, to see beneath the surface and try to give us guidance on how to overcome evil. Classical Odyssey again is not presented in the Quran, even though I've seen in the literature that some people have actually tried to um, come up with the classical Odyssey in the Quran. And um, theologians, as we saw, attribute evil to man's conduct. Philosophers really wo woven that um, discussion into their ontological perspective and talk about Wujud and Adam and see evil um, from that perspective. And as we just saw, mystics. Um, really view the tila and suffering as a necessary component in man's spiritual journey, which is absolutely uh, helpful to us. Um, very quickly, um, I just want to share with you, as far as future development in this area is concerned, I myself would love to see more work done on the existential aspect of the Odyssey. You know, usually, um, you know, we start from uh, theories and then we try to apply those theories to human subjects, um, especially these days, you really need to start, the scholars, I mean, start looking at the actual experiences. Try to see if people are finding meaning on the encountered suffering. Um, of course, emphasize on preventing evil, but uh, at the same time, when evil happens, uh, try to answer those existent questions, especially for the youth. I work with a lot of younger generation where I teach, and I, I see that they lost the meaning of life. There is no purpose for them. And I feel like we can really look into this from the existential questions and start from, uh, from human subjects and then hopefully lead to theories that can help um, other scholars. Thank you so much for um, uh, giving your time um, on your Sunday afternoon to this presentation. I hope that you find the material um, somewhat useful. Um, I had sent, I, I guess, Hakan the, the paper that I had published about this um, uh, two years ago uh, in the Journal of Religions. And uh, of course, the book is also available. And thank you so much again. And hopefully, we can have a um, fruitful uh, discussion. Thank you very much. This was a, a very good uh, overall presentation covering only. starting from the Quran and all the way, you know, in all aspects of Islamic thought. So this was very good. Uh, we already have uh, two uh, questions. Uh, I know, I saw Hakan's first and to Banur, inshallah. Yes. Uh, Hakan, do you, would you like to ask your question in person or should I read it from the chat box? Uh, it would be nice if you could read the uh, Al-Farsan Ujam and maybe with some okay. explanation. Yeah. Okay, this is the question. Yes, uh, we are sent to this world for a trial, but then uh, the question is uh, concerning a baby who is killed in a war. How can we relate this to trial? The baby even could not be a mature human being to understand what is good and what is evil then how the baby, uh, how can we relate this with the teachings of the Quran from the perspective of compassion and mercy? Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Haikan, for that question. This is actually one of the classical questions uh, that comes up in the theological discussions because, you know, uh, like I said before, uh, animal suffering 
children suffering, uh, you know, children who have not really done any sin, right? And, and that goes on to say that really trials and, and iptala is not because necessarily someone has done a sin, right? Uh, prophets necessarily didn't do any sins, right? They were the best people, the best role models. So um, that, to answer your question as, as best of, uh, I can, um, it, this all goes back to the purpose of the creation, right? And, and the fact that us human beings, because we are um, physical being in this world, right? We are bound by, um, you know, our physical being, we are not going to fully understand everything that happens in the creation, right? So one answer that is not an adequate answer, but can be given to this question, is that that is the trial or the iptala for the parents, right? Because the parents who are going through this difficult time, um, it's ex extraordinary iptala for the parents. Um, they would have to deal with this. They would have to reconsider the way that they live. So one of the answers that could be given is really the fact that that kind of iptala has to do um, for the parents. But again, it's not 100%. It's, it's something that that we can speculate on, you know, we can discuss and we can maneuver about with our own limited understanding, right? Um, one thing that I think modern man has to realize, and I have tried to uh, discuss this, actually I was in Germany a um, couple of months ago for, um, for a presentation on evil and human suffering from Islamic perspective. And I, I tried to bring up the, the whole idea of, you know, philosophers and theologians stand up and explaining this issue, which is a very difficult issue to talk about, and then claim to have all the answers is the wrong way. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not the right way to explain the situation. We can certainly try, you know, we can certainly understand the Quran better, read Nursi, read Rumi, um, reflect on our own uh, personal, uh, you know, iptilas and come up with answers. So definitely we can ponder about that we are limited, right? And um, in our own minds, and we are not going to be able to understand the entire wisdom behind things that happen. Remember the parable of Hazrat Musa and Khez in the, in the Quran, right? Those, the time that, um, you know, he does certain things and Khez and, and um, you know, the Hazrat Musa questions him, oh my God, why did you do that? And this was uh, unnecessary and he said, you don't know. You don't know what, what am I doing here, right? You don't even understand, even though he, most, Moses was a prophet. So again, going, taking us back to the whole notion of the design of this universe is as such, right? That things are gonna happen that we, we are not gonna have any explanation. All that we could do is to try to come up with philosophical, theological, and mystical perspective. If you were to ask, Nursi, Ustad Nursi, this question, I am 100% sure his answer would be, this is the iptala for the parents. He has a treaty actually on this, when a parent um, loses a child and he writes a letter to that parent to consult them about how to go about keeping their iman and continue with the trust and tawakkul that they have. So again, the trial is for the parents, um, 100%. This is not an adequate answer. This is the best I think that we can reflect upon, um, again, with our own limited wisdom. Well, thank you very much. And now, uh, Dr. Tubanur Özkan, I see uh, Dr. Mustafa Tuna's hand, then he will be next. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much, Sister Nasreen. That was really very nice. Um, I, I, I always have the same kind of you know um uh problem when when it comes to the problem of evil and the whole discussion about it uh the existential aspect of it is always much more difficult to explain than the theoretical and theological and philosophical aspect of it mm -hmm. uh philosophically and theologically you know things can be explained uh you know in in, in one way or another uh, but when it comes to the existential um the the act actual existential aspect of things become uh, much more difficult on a completely different level, basically. Uh, 
-hmm. When I think, for example, about, uh, you know, child abuse, uh, you know, where, where a child is abused by the, by the person uh, he or she trusts the most mm -hmm. over many, many years, uh, you know, this is, this is also, I think, uh, an issue where also um, the, psychological, the psychological aspect also plays a major role, isn't it? So um, it's not only about, uh, you know, um, it's, it's not a physical, uh, merely a physical uh, sort of uh, heart. When you talk, for example, about mm -hmm. when the way, the way Ghazali, for example, answers, you know, the question of, you know, how to deal with, with, uh, with that sort of thing. He basically, you know, the, the, he gives a very bold answer to that. You know, he says, you know, uh, you can only make zulm to, to, some, to, to someone else's, if you, if you violate someone else's property, that will be called zulm. Uh, but if it's your own property, you can't call it zulm. So Allah will not zulm anyone because everything is his. So this yeah. is the answer that he gives to, to that question, which is quite a bold answer at the same time. You know, it's difficult to, to, that, you know, to explain to someone else who has suffered may, maybe, you know, in a major way, uh, for, on an, you know, from an existential perspective. In Imam Nursi, the same, you know, when, when he talks, for example, about the, you know, uh, the, the, um, uh, the tailor, you know, who will tailor someone out, a model, you know, the model has no right to complain, which he also, I think the example he also has from Imam Ghazali, you know, again, there we can see, you know, okay, he can do whatever he wants because it, it's all his anyway, you know, mm -hmm. so, but, but from an existential perspective, it becomes very, very difficult to, to justify something to someone who has, uh, has a major, uh, you know, psychological trauma to mm -hmm. say, you know, you have right to complain because everything is not yours anyway you know it's not you it's not yours so you can't complain so it becomes very much much more difficult to explain so i'm, I'm i wonder whether therefore uh, or i'm not not wonder but i think it's it's very very important in that sense that psycholo psychology and and mystical theology maybe and and you know go hand in hand in that sense you know that you know and and go together in a, in a approaching the whole idea and the whole topic, isn't it? Absolutely, Tumbal. Thank you for that, um, you know, comment. I 100% I, I agree with you. Um, I think that in modern psychology, actually, um, there is a, a methodology called CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And um, that's where the, you know, psychological aspect of any kind of harm that has been done, you know, to a person, uh, whether in childhood in when they were growing up however the case may be um, but that methodology from this from modern psychology actually goes hand in hand with uh, the mystical um, you know or existential uh, way of looking at this as at this notion um, I actually had a presentation in one of the universities in New York um, and I talked about how Islam looks at the whole life as as uh, as a comprehensive way right so when there's an iptila is not just one aspect that you're trying to develop your trust and have like you talked about Azali and Rumi and, and Imam Nursi it's more about developing yourself right and self-improvement so self-improvement goes hand in hand actually with the modern psychology with cognitive behavior therapy where the therapies or the psychologists uh, you know hears the person out right so understands the, the, the dilemmas and the iptilas that this person has been gone through, but then helps the person build on that building character. And instead of looking at it from a negative perspective, try to build up on that. We actually have, uh, you know, some of the major philosophers and, and um, psychologists in this field who actually were subjected to many of the things that you mentioned in your comments, right? Who had experienced personal, um, you know, zone, you know, in their childhood, and they managed. This is extremely, um, you know, um, uh, helpful for us to understand that people are actually have the capability that to move on and to use that experience as as bad and as negative, as harmful, as destructive as it was to build upon that. You know, Professor Frankel, um, he's a Jew. He's the doctor 
doctor who was in, in the Holocaust and he survived, right? And he has a theory of the meaning of life, the logotherapy that is utilized, right, in, uh, in the whole um, psychology today. So he's a perfect example. And there are many, many, I do, his name just came to my mind uh, because of his, his theory. But we see that uh, modern psychology tabbing into, actually the, the conference that I had to present in New York was exactly about that. Does Islam, can Islam offer anything to help with the issues that people go through, things that is totally out of their hand, right? And the connection between philosophical understanding and the existential understanding and the psychology um, that comes into play. So definitely uh, CBT would help those people. And again, it goes back on how much the person wants to really invest their time and, and to the self-improvement, but it's definitely doable. Yes, uh, Dr. Mustafa Tuna, please go ahead. Thank you, Salam alaikum. Uh, two questions. One, uh, have you also considered the word uh, fitna, fatana, in the Quran in a similar vein? And yes. the sec yeah, and the second is uh, when you uh, gave us the comparison between Mu'tazila and uh, Ash'ari, uh, where does the Maturidiya stand in that? Right. So, yes. Yeah, so, um, I think I alluded, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did I interrupt you? Okay. Uh, I think I alluded to um, the fact that Ibtila is the more comprehensive terminology used in the Quran. But in the book, in the typology, the first chapter of the, of the book is the whole typology. And uh, a lot of verses that fitna is used within that same context is utilized. And fitna is actually grouped in all of those four categories, right? That, um, that I showed uh, on, on that slide. So definitely fitna is one of those terminology. I focus on this presentation on ibtila uh, because I know that bala and ibtila is one of those terms that unfortunately has been um, introduced to us very negatively, you know, uh, and, and try to uh, decontrust basically uh, and unveil um, the, the notion. But yes, fitna is part of those discussions as well. Uh, other, you know, I concentrated on Mutazilit and Ash'ari, um, but clearly Matrudis had their own opinions. They concentrated on, you know, um, attrib divine attributes of Allah, talking about uh, human free will, um, are we uh, able to reduce power of God? Um, you know, there are a lot of discussions, you know, and we also have the Shi'is, right? Not just the Matrudis, they have the Shi'is, um, theologians who have their own opinion about this, as well as the fact that, um, you know, for example, according to um, uh, Tusi, um, uh, the, one of the famous uh, uh, Shi'i Shi uh, theologians, uh, values um, in acts, they actually have intrinsic value. So um, in his idea is that um, human beings um, are able to discern that which is good uh, from that which is bad uh, independently from the revelation because we have been created as such. And in fact, he goes on to say that, um, you know, human beings have to uh, authentically accept the message of revelation by their own uh, intelligence, right? So therefore, if we are not, uh, you know, equipped with that kind of faculty to understand revelation, then how can we, uh, and, uh, you know, if we, if we cannot discern that which is good and that which is bad independently from the revelation, then how can we say that I accepted the revelation? Basically, the argument goes like that. So yes, so there are a lot of different theological um, you know, schools that talk about this. But again, the idea uh, mostly was crystallized between the Mu'tazilis and, and the Ash'aris. Well, thank you very much. There is uh, one question in the chat box again by Professor Nawzad. Is wrong and evil necessary to try freedom as psychological free will view? Uh, can you um, elaborate? Is wrong and evil necessary to try freedom as psychological free view? Are you saying that we have to? Uh, I, if I understand your question correctly, and if I don't understand it, please um, please elaborate. Um, I think what you're asking is that 
is even necessary uh, for human free will to go through and, and, and basically based on that, yes. Um, in fact, um, you know, I, I didn't mention, I didn't have time, but in my studies, I, had, I have done some um, comparative uh, theological work with Christianity. And one of the great uh, philosophers in, uh, in the 20th century was Professor John Hick. And he actually writes a lot about this issue and talks about theodicy. And he, th he takes his cue uh, from Iranus, who was one of the first, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Christian, uh, you know, theologians, uh, Eastern, Eastern Christianity. And, and the whole idea of, of soul making theodicy um, has been actually created on, on the notion of Iranus. And he talks about, yes, evil and, and, and wrongdoing is actually necessary. You know, is, if you were to look at an example saying that you're bringing up a child, right? And if this child is brought up in an environment, all of us are parents, if you bring up our children in an environment that everything is foolproof for them, right? There is no challenge, there is no difficulty, there is no wrongdoing, then do we think that that child once he or she enters the, uh, the workforce or the school, is he or she going to be tolerated? No, he or she is not gonna have the, the faculty or the guidelines to be able to, to deal with a lot of difficulties, right? So the idea is that we have been created to live this kind of life with all of these trials on this earth for a purpose, right? So that we become um, sort of um, specialized in dealing with this and, and actualizing our inner potentials. The inner potentials, Belkova, right, is not going to get actualized unless, unless there is wrongdoing, right? And so the idea here is not to do it wrong, but to realize that the wrong was done, right? And then build up on that and move on and learn from it. Constant transformation, right? through various difficulties. And again, remember, Iftila is not just about uh, illnesses and difficulties. It's all about prosperity too, in wealth. So if I'm wealthy, what am I doing with my wealth? I'm being tested, right? If I'm healthy, am I using my health in the way in the path that Allah has intended for me? If I'm not, then I'm definitely misusing that blessing. I'm deviating from the past, and even though I'm healthy and I'm wealthy, I'm actually living in Sha'r, right? I'm actually living a life in Sha'r and evil, even though on the surface, there's nothing wrong, I'm very happy, right? So it's really important to realize that everything is a test, but you're absolutely right. I think that um, uh, wrongdoing and, and evil is definitely a necessary component of our human experience on this life. Thank you for that question. Uh, there is a, a comment uh, again in the chat box. Dr. Uh, Abdul Aziz, very nice comment. I will read if you would like to say something on this also. He says, within the Manai Harfi approach of Nursi, to understand the concept of Shar and Ibtila, we need to, un we need to see the relationship between these concepts like sunnatullah in creation, hikmatullah, adatullah, rahmatullah, istikhlaf, namely vicegerency, jazaullah, namely reward of God, and the concept of positive sabr, linking all these concepts together will help us understand the wisdom behind ibtila and shar, and place it properly in God's big des design for the creation and its wisdom. I don't know if you were able to read it in the chat box also. Please, yes. Uh, yes, if you I want did. to say something. Yes, I just looked at the chat. Thank you, Dr. Abdulaziz. That's a very um, uh, excellent uh, reminder and comment from uh, the teaching of Said Nursi, the comparison between Ma'anaya Harfi and Ma'anaya Ismi, um, and the various um, you know, notions about trust and, and about sap. I think I alluded to this uh, when I was talking about uh, the mystical perspective and I brought up um, Nurse's name. Yes, and again, to add to what you said, because his whole theology actually is dependent on 
and the divine names and attributes, you know, he constantly brings this back to the notion of, um, you know, everything in this world is the interplay, right, between the Jamali and the Jalali and divine attributes, right? And when you consider Manai Harfi and Manai Ismi, like you mentioned in this, uh, in this uh, comment, and Sunatullah and Hikmatullah, basically the whole wisdom behind the creation, right? If you were to use one term that covers the whole uh, area of what Nursery is talking about is the wisdom, right, of Allah behind this whole creation, which helps us understand the notion of Ibtila and even some guidelines as we go through it. Absolutely, I 100% agree with you. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you very much. I don't know if anybody else, I don't see any hands. I see uh, one small comment. I don't know if uh, Hakan, he, you want to make that a question or just you just put it there in the chat box. Uh, I would, uh, as uh, Nasreen just, uh, you know, mentioned, uh, we cannot, I think, completely uh, respond to that question because I asked that question because I have read an article uh, which was written in Brazil and many people were giving up religion because of that question. So uh, uh, when we think about a baby, yes, it can be a trial uh, for the parents but sometimes babies are even abused by uh, their parents. So uh, before uh, you know, they grow up or they uh, can have ability to think which is good or bad. So the question is, uh, you know, they cannot be a human being to be tried uh, as a baby, as an individual, not uh, related to their family or other people. Of course, it's a big trial for the relatives of the baby and for humanity, of course. But for, as an individual, uh, for a baby, how can we relate this uh, with the compassion and the merciful God? So this was the question, uh, and then they surveyed this in Brazil, and many Catholics were uh, giving up from the religion uh, because of, uh, they couldn't respond to these kind of questions. When we look at the world, what's going on with the violence and etc. So let me also think about as a model, as uh, uh, in the Risale, uh, Said Nursi mentioned, you are a model, uh, Tuban also mentioned, uh, so we cannot complain. But a baby it cannot be a model because uh, he or she can, uh, doesn't have uh, any idea or any conscience to think about uh, that. So this was the question, and we, we, when we talk about the suffering of animals, uh, and other, uh, you know, creatures, uh, we can, I believe we cannot, uh, you know, relate them completely with the human beings and animals uh, in regards to children. So this was uh, the question, of course, uh, and I also want to thank, uh, but uh, Dr. Nasreen, uh, you did a great response to my question. Of course, we cannot respond uh, completely. Maybe this is why it is kind of mystical and uh, Dr. Abdulaziz uh, Bergos, uh, I also want to thank to him. Uh, he gave a broader uh, approach, uh, so maybe uh, we should also, also mention this. So th this was my uh, humble question. Thank you. Okay, so that, that's uh, very Hakan, good. Just quickly, maybe if I may interfere, uh, Brother Hakan, uh, the, the, I think the, the difficulty here is that there is not only one answer uh, to this to this to these kind of questions anyway you yeah. know it is it is a whole uh, set of approaches uh, and those set of approaches in order to be able to gain all of these uh, these approaches um, you know there, there there needs to be maybe a lifelong you know educating of yourself sure. uh, of the human individual in general and I think this is one of the reasons why we why we exist mm -hmm. why, why Allah has created us uh, one of the main reasons you know uh, but at the same time, I think one, maybe one more important aspect also is, you know, that death is not sharp. And I think the whole idea that death is not sharp also is not very much established, especially mm. in the Western concept, uh, context, you know, mm. because it's always, uh, there is a connotation that death is evil. Mm. Uh, and I think this is very much embedded in, uh, mm. you know, if, if in the philosophical and also the theological even, uh, you know, uh, teachings. 
Uh, and I think that's also one of the main problems, especially in the West, that death is nevertheless, you know, although it is being approached, you know, uh, Christianly and religiously, it is still, there is the notion of, of you know, equating death with evil. And I think that's, that's one of the main reasons why people have, even, even priests, you know, at some point have difficulties, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, um, justifying maybe uh, why Allah would allow a child, you know, to die. But from our perspective, you know, there is no evil in death. So there is a much, I think there is a slightly different approach uh, to, 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 to that sort of event, I would say, you know, from an Islamic perspective. Am I wrong, Sister Nasreen? Um, no, I, thank you for that, Chubaru and, and, and Hakan, both of you, great comments. I would agree with uh, Chubaru with and also uh, some of the things that Hakan said. I think that if we go back to what we said about the umbrella view of the, um, of the Muslim mystics, right? And remember what I said about Ibn Arabi, right? So if we, if we always keep that in mind as a, uh, from the balcony view again and think about Okay, if we understand that creation um, and God were all the same in this perfect light, right? When creation got separated from the essence of Allah, which was pure light, evil comes into play, right? So this happens, this must happen at the level of the creation, right? So right out of bat, we, we understand that once creation happens, you know, or happened in the act of creation itself, there is the separation from the divine essence of light and therefore evil enters, no matter what, right? So when evil enters, now evil takes different forms, right? It may, things may happen to a child, things may happen somebody in, in the war, some, somebody may get in prison. How many people do we know that got into prison unjustly? right, and died in prison, and after their death, they, they found out that they were innocent. Imagine, I mean, there's so much different forms of evil, and I understand that the question about the baby, Hakan, is the most difficult one, because that baby hasn't done anything, right? But again, we have to take our mindset out of that perspective, and look at it from a more umbrella, and a more, uh, you know, a wider scope. It's as if you are, um, you know, an ontology, maybe, maybe I can make this um, comparison. You know, when you are driving on the road, right, uh, on the highway, you know, on the Istanbul, um, you see that a big truck is coming up, right? This is one of the major big trucks, right? And your car is a little car. And you sort of let that big car pass by you, this big truck, right? But if you were on the airplane, flying from Istanbul to somewhere else, and you're viewing that same highway and that same truck, what do you see from the balcony, from that, from the airplane, uh, you know, as the airplane comes down, you see little bits, right? So you see this big truck that used to be huge, now it's all of a sudden uh, a little car, right? So I'm, I'm not trying to minimize the issues. I'm just trying to, to maybe, um, you know, shed light on a different perspective or, or the, a different mindset. You know, there's a great book um, that has been written by a great psychologist that we use here in New York as part of educating the kids. And it, the, the book is actually called Mindset, right? So people who have growth mindset, right? Where you deconstruct things in your head and you try to reflect upon it differently and see if you can reach a different conclusion, right? So. Again, while the answer to the um, question on, on a baby is a difficult one, no one has the, ha, can give a perfect answer. Um, all we can do is to try to understand that because that we are free, that parent are free to do what they want. So if they choose to deviate from their path and harm their own kid, it is a choice that they make. Unfortunately, that child is a subject of that abuse, right? We understand there's a zone that is going on on that, on that child, right? But at the same time, that parent is exercising the human free will that they have. And there is no other way. There is no other way for, for this to work, right? So that child hopefully um, get, grows up. And again, through the 
uh, psychological methodology of CBT can build their own life and can pass by what happened. If a child dies, like Durbanu explained beautifully, death is not the end of life, it's actually the beginning of this of another life, right? Is uh, the Quran, I mentioned in the presentation that in Surah Al Mulk, Allah says, Khalaqal Mount Wal Hayat. I have created Mount. And it comes before Hayat. How interesting is that? So, so Mount is not death, is not the end of life, is the new beginning. So that child, if we believe that there's an eternal life, right? That child continues when he dies uh, in a better place, in a better life, right? And that parent would join him in, in the near future, right? So I think, again, changing the whole mindset would give us a little more maybe relief uh, about saying, and John, he talks about this, um, all of the Muslim philosophers and theologians talk about this. We don't know what happens when we leave this world. We do know that something continues. That we do know, right? We can feel it. We know that this world wasn't created in vain and unpurposeful. And after this, uh, this temporal world, there is an internal, uh, eternal world that continues. So that would give that parent, hopefully, some relief, right? And Nursi talks about that as well. Uh, but again, um, we are limited and we hope for guidance from God and Allah all the time. Thank you. May, may I also add something to it? I don't know if you are out of time. Okay, uh, please. Go yes, ahead. It, should be, it should be quick, inshallah. Uh, the, a, a baby can be a model. I think that, I mean, I don't know if that was, uh, if I understood uh, that uh, accurately, but a baby can be a model. A baby cannot be a model from the point of view of the divine names that, that pertain to taking account and punishing and so on and so forth because the baby does not have accountability. But the baby can be a model if you understand a model as being a locus of appearance of the manifestation of divine names. Even a baby that's suffering is still a locus of appearance for the divine name Al-Hay, Al-Qayyum, Al-Razaq, to the extent that it is being provided, to the extent that it is you know, kept alive and so on and so forth. And therefore, a baby is still still a locus of appearance for the manifestation of many divine names, and that in itself is good. Absolutely, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you very much. We have uh, one more uh, question. Dr. Mehmet uh, Salih Sayilgan, go ahead. Assalamu uh, alaikum everyone. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Dr. Nuspati, so I enjoyed uh, listening to you. I have been on and off, so I'm sorry if some of the things that, um, that I will ask and make comments uh, are already said uh, or you know answered. So one thing, uh, actually I have been, this is like uh, maybe the seventh year, I have been uh, teaching the problem of evil and suffering at the university. So most of my students are uh, basically non-believer, uh, or at least they wouldn't buy the Islamic approach of problem of evil and suffering um, so one thing is that every semester i assigned uh, you know nurses um, uh, piece on uh, the condo the you know on the death of a child you know a child of his friend so usually students are really furious uh, so i haven't seen i mean <laughs> i haven't seen any positive comment just barely you will see among maybe 40 students two three four if you you know if you find five because you are lucky but generally um uh, it seems this is challenging, uh, and again, so I, uh, of course uh, we engage with uh, you know basically theistic and non-theistic uh, again you know so much diversity, and at least from the theistic perspective, um, as um, as Doctor uh, Roshati has basically put it uh, very well, so the you know one major at, at this theistic answer is the, the idea of test and trial, right? The Quran constantly brings this up. Uh, the idea, I mean, you mentioned you emphasize the, the the purpose, like a purposeful or evil and suffering can be an instrument, right? Um, and then the other, the other major argument is free will, right? So that basically uh, you, you have natural disasters, but when it comes to moral evil, it is all about human beings because they use their uh, will and, and, and God, because God gave them the liberty to, to, to act the way they want. 
right, two major arguments. Uh, but again, from a non-theistic perspective, of course, there are lots of problems with this positions. One is, uh, again, in many ways, uh, it is disproportionate, right? Evil and suffering. Uh, and again, Hakan gave the example of a baby uh, or, I mean, again, one of the, the major voice in this uh, kind of representing non-theistic view is William Rowe. He gives the example of um, uh, basically a deer is burned in a, in a forest. Uh, so he questions that, well, you know, if, 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 even if it is a purpose, there is a, uh, we can say, well, evil is an instrument, but why, why, it's, why in this way, in a way that you see the image of God as if, as if he wants to torture um, people? Because, uh, you know, again, the, uh, the, the deer can still die, uh, but why, why in, a, in a very uh, brutal way? Uh, so this is again at this uh, question, and honestly, someone who is engaging with various uh, perspectives, uh, somehow it seems, uh, and again my understanding is, it is really difficult to to rationalize this problem of evil and suffering. Uh, so again, uh, both in Islamic literature as well as uh, you know other in other theistic religious traditions, there is a, I mean there is a constant attempt to to rationalize, to find wisdom, to find arguments for for theodicy in favor of god's justice uh, but it seems i mean i i don't know if if uh, this is so this this will be my question maybe uh, just to think of um, uh, the problem of evil and suffering as a mystery could it be the best approach for us to think that there is really no no answer uh, to this question but rather it is something that that the believers will will carry with them throughout their life to think of as a mystery rather than attempting to find answers so this is i wonder well, how would you engage with this question thank you sure thank you uh mehmet for that comment and question so going back to the beginning of your discussion um some of it has already been discussed but one thing i want to touch upon on is the animal suffering right mm -hmm. the, uh, <clears throat> the example that you gave with that deer and uh, you know, from the Mutazilit uh, perspective, there's a really great book that I would suggest you teaching this, uh, if you haven't seen it, by Ghazi Abdul Jabbar. And mm -hmm. there's, a, there's the English, um, I actually have the book. I can send you the information later. I have it in my library. Um, yeah, please. Uh -huh. Yes, that actually he talks about the entire human suffering uh, from the Mutazilit perspective. And there's a dissertation that done on this, and there's a book that was published uh, in English, so I'll, I'll send you the, um, the information. So Ghazi okay. Abdul Jabbar actually talks about this extensively, right? And um, addresses the animal suffering. What's quite interesting about Ghazi Abdul Jabbar is that he actually says that all of the animals um, in the other world, life after death, they, they are going to be compensated for the, for the hurt uh, that they have felt. Um, in this world, right? So whether it's a child, whether it's animal, I know there is no comparison between a child and animal, but, in, but you know, again, looking at it from a wider perspective and wider scope, um, it's, it's quite interesting to see that uh, many of the Mutazilit, um, you, know, you know, thinkers actually taught about this and talked about this and wrote about this uh, when uh, not not in the modern time, you know, it's all those years ago, which extremely is important for us to at least uh, be aware of that. Um, to um, basically answer your question or comment on the mystery aspect, I think that at some um, degree, it's always going to remain a mystery. And I, I, I did touch upon that, um, that we will try to come up with answers, right? and uh, formulate ways by which human beings can be addressed. I myself am not too much interested in the philosophical and theological perspectives because it doesn't really help the person who's going through the suffering, right? Who's going mm. through the iptala. And that's why I was suggesting that perhaps in the literature, people who are working on this, and maybe you and I can work on this as a, as a, as a joint project, mm -hmm. um, yeah. is, yeah, it's, inshallah, it's on the existential question, especially since we are dealing with the youth, right? Uh, I'm sure you found that, I mean, I, when I finished my, uh, my lessons um, before the COVID, of course, I was teaching on campus, 
And there wasn't one night that I had one or two students um, you know, stay in the class. And these are all American students, they're all engineering, none of them are Muslims. Um, majority of them were brought up in Christian homes, but then they decided that they don't want to have any religion, right? Uh, and so they, they openly talk about that in their oral presentation. So I know them really well. But they always say at the end of night, one or two people to say that, uh, you know, can you help me find meaning of my life? Mm -hmm. like, like there is no purpose. It's as if, it's as if this younger generation, uh, due to, I don't know, lack of, um, you know, of course, faith perhaps, or maybe lack of the understanding of parents, perhaps too much technology involvement, right, has taken away from them the purpose of life, the meaning of life. So I think that, um, you know, looking at this from the existential uh, perspective, right, and, and trying to address it from the person who is actually going through this experience and then come up with theories, right, instead of come up, coming up with theories that apply to human experiences, I think it should be the other way around, right? We look at the experiences, we talk to people, we listen to their anxieties, we try to help, and then formulate um, you know, a theory based on their understanding. That's what existential theodicy, I think, comes into play. Nursi has a lot to say about that. I think uh, Ghazali, Rumi, you know, a lot of uh, new, uh, actually, um, writers in, in, in Christianity, like I said, John Hick, um, I'm sure um, uh, Mehmed, you have come up across of his mm -hmm. his uh, readings. You know, and the love soul of soul making God. theodicy, right? Soul making theodicy. Yeah. Yes, the love of God and the evil. The, the the huge book he talks about this a lot. And at the end of the day, even John Hick, being the most prominent philosopher of religion in 20th century, even for him, at the very end of his book, he says some portion of this I have no answer for, right? And I do know, he says, I do know that when I leave, and he actually did pass away uh, two years ago um, in UK. He says, I know that when I go, um, I, I, I'm going to find that this little bit of answer that I don't know now. And I've seen um, a reflection of this in the Quran, when the Quran says to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that your eyes has come I know like a hadith, right? Like you, your eyes become hadith, or hand, means that it becomes so sharp, right? As soon as you leave this body, the entire, um, you know, uh, dark areas that we didn't understand comes into our understanding. And so as John Hicks says, and I 100% agree with him, there is hope, there is a way to reconcile with the evil and the trials and tribulations that we go through, there is a character building uh, element into this that only if people find out, even those people, like I said, who have been terribly, um, you know, um, you know, uh, been had a difficult trial, uh, a psychological trauma, uh, going through the CBT. I, I have examples of these people um, that I know of who are totally a different person and now can speak about their experiences that it was so difficult to even think about, but use that as the character building and come out with um, ways by which they can help other people. So modern psychology in um, connection with um, these understandings of nursery and Rumi, I think can do a lot, can go a long way. So just um, thank you. This is very helpful. Just a follow up, like a brief follow up. Actually, there is um, a, a scholar, a biblical scholar, uh, Barth Ehrman. Uh, so, I mean, basically an evangelical uh, great scholar and then eventually turned to be an atheist, non-believer. And now he's one of recent books is on, um, on evil and suffering. So the interesting thing, it seems that he lost his faith while he was teaching undergrads at the university, because when, when he was teaching problem of evil and suffering. Mm -hmm. So this is basically our story. Somehow the, the, the narrative against the theodicy is so dominant basically on campus setup. Um, so um, if, well, I hope you will not lose all of our faith. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think we have a lot to build upon, you know. Uh, from the Quranic perspective, and like I said, from Nursi, Rumi, Ghazali, and all of the above, 
And you know, at some point, um, if someone feels that they need to leave their faith to become more um, intelligent, then certainly that's their uh, prerogative, that's their choice, right? And we don't think of them any less because they made that choice, right? But there's also other, um, you know, other people in, in, the, in the Western world that can be used on the other side of the spectrum that you just gave an example. So Anthony Flew um, was the most important, most prominent, um, you know, agnostic uh, uh, philosopher the 20th century, right? And at the age of 83, he did an interview and he apologized um, and said that I, all my life, all of my writing, again, he's, he's, he's the philosopher of, of um, you know, atheist a philosopher who um, everyone, all of the atheist philosophers after him, they actually referred their findings to him, right? So he's the leader in that, right? But he himself at age of 83, and there's an interview on YouTube, please um, uh, search for him if you haven't seen that video, Anthony Flew, F-L-E-W, and he actually apologizes, and he says, at this age, um, I wanna apologize, and I wanna say that there is something above and beyond, and, the, and people are just unbelievably cannot accept this, and, and the person who's interviewing him, he says, all these years, you advocated for that God doesn't exist, and all of a sudden now, and all of these philosophers base their philosophies behind you. You're such an important figure in, in being atheist. And why now? And he says, the genetic uh, science has proved to me that there is an intelligence design, that there's a wisdom behind this creation. Whether you want to call it God or you want to call it wisdom, now I know this and I have to say it before I die. So, so Mehmet, uh, while we have examples on this other side, right, we have examples on the other side as well, who have come to believe and, and, and understanding that there is a God after all these years. So again, it's, it's, it's how people perceive and how they reflect and personal experiences, I think, uh, more than anything, um, opens our eyes, right, and gives us context to which we are teaching. And if there is no context, right, if there is no uh, heartfelt understanding of the iptila, it will be difficult to justify, right? Um, but, if, but if it's a personal experience, then it becomes much more tangible, right? Uh, to be able to talk about it and hopefully uh, have something new. Sister Nasreen, if you remember, uh, at the end of my talk last uh, two weeks ago, I said that uh, bottom line is, uh, you know, that we surrender completely to Allah and that we also ask, uh, ask him, you know, to uh, deliver us from all sorts of uh, shar, you know. Um, we have that in the surahs of the Quran as well. Uh, so ultimately it, it is, you know, all on him. And as you said, it is the personal journey of everyone. Um, some people uh, will, uh, you know, leave, leave uh, uh, or turn away from Allah. Some people will turn towards Allah, you know, depending on, and they might, they may go through the same, uh, or very similar experiences in their life. And if you look at it, you know, one has a response completely different than the other. So I think it is uh, indeed, um, you know, um, also the importance, you know, that we ask Allah to, to, to give us from his wisdom, because Allah says in the Quran, whomever I have given wisdom, uh, uh, you know, he has received a lot of goodness, a lot of khair. Uh, and I think there is a hikmah behind even that verse as well. So, um, you know, ultimately it boils down, as I said, you know, to, to the very important notion of surrendering uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because without his help, we would be lost anyway. Yes, absolutely. As Rumi said, and I read the poetry uh, on the last slide, submit, right? And uh, the chickpeak story, the rug story. So um, try to get the dust out of, out of our inner uh, eyeness, right? The veil of eyeness. And I think that that poetry from Rumi ex speaks to all of us, right? Because we all clean up our rugs, right? And coming from a part of the Middle East, and we all have beautiful rugs, and we always want to clean them, right? So um, I think the fact that we can say that, um, you know, our our wujud is full of the dust of Ines, and how can I, even if nothing comes on my way, you know, um, how can I remove the dust? 
voluntarily, right? And be proactive in that spiritual journey. Um, so more so when it hits, what is the lesson to be learned from this, right? And again, once there are one or two experiences, personal experiences, I think it becomes more tangible and the surrender piece that you're talking about becomes more of a reality than, uh, an, uh, than just a discussion, right? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. There is uh, one more comment in the chat room. I would like to read if you want to respond to that by Dr. Najati. If everything is just manifestation of God's names, our concern for justice is just a drop of divine justice. This means he shall care about justice more than everyone else. The main difference, he has infinite knowledge and power to assure perfect justice. <clears throat> so I suppose he is trying to say here that that means everything that he does is just, even if we perceive it as something evil. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah, I think this was also uh, mentioned in the presentation. Absolutely. I mean, this is the theology and the Ash'arit's understanding of... Uh, of um, you know evil and suffering in the world and the fact that um, you know conversely to Mu'tazilit when they concentrate on jo God's justice, uh, Ash'arit uh, concentrate on the on the omnipotence, uh, the powerfulness of God and knowledge, but at the same time saying that he is he, he is just in everything that he does, right? Whether we like it or not, basically. But again, I just want to caution everyone that this has implications, right? Um, mm -hmm. That governments misuse this unfortunately for many years as we know throughout the history of islam um, so um, that kind of understanding that everything that happens uh, is, is the justice of god um, some governments take this into their hand and misuse it of course but but, but then again it is it is a dilemma that we are dealing with right and there's no uh, going back so I just just wanted to highlight that but yes you're absolutely right yeah that's the understanding of the Ash'ari theologians as well. Thank you. And also okay. just one thing, uh, I mean, the, at, at this, the, the problem with this, I mean, if we take it as our departure point, one question, another question would be just, uh, this may lead to Muslims to be bystander, basically, whenever they see um, injustice, uh, they say, okay, well, God will take care of this justice anyway, so just let me just uh, do my prayer, you know, do nice stuff and... Uh, everything will be all right. Um, Absolutely. And that's why, if you remember on the last slide with future development, one of the ideas was that we need to encourage prevention of evil, right? Mm -hmm. So even though we try to find answers, we must not eliminate, we must not minimize the importance of being proactive in the society and in our own life, whether it be personal or not, to um, you know, prevent evil as much as possible, right? To, to try to help people to uh, prevent evil, to minimize evil, e evil uh, happening. Um, all of that is everyone's responsibility. But at the same time, um, knowing and coming to terms with the fact that um, there is still going to be evil you know, acts in the world. And again, keeping Ibn Arabi's points in mind, and uh, the fact that as soon as creation happened, right and the creation got separated from the essence of god which is pure light darkness enters there is no other way right unless you keep creation with the essence of allah which didn't happen creation happened so means that you know that act of creation as soon as it happened it left the essence of allah which was pure light and therefore darkness or a little bit of lack of light enters and that's what evil is so Evil is always going to be in the world, but we must continue to prevent it, to encourage our youth to prevent it, to work towards understanding it. And again, looking towards more answers on the existential aspect of theodicy rather than more theoretical. Because uh, I know that the younger generation um, need us and need answers to that question. Alpha your mic is mute, please unmute. 
Oh, okay. I said we have just a few more minutes, but two more hands I can see. I don't know if Dr. Mustafa, he wants to ask questions, his still hand is no, up. I think, uh, yeah. Oh, I think okay. it's so a let's, yeah. let's go ahead with Gökmen in that case. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, it's really good to, you know, listen. I'm a lay person. I'm not academic. I just have interest. Uh, and then I really, you know, enjoy listening to you all. But I thought maybe I have a couple of uh, comments to mention with you all. Uh, maybe looking at things from different angle as a lay person, not academic. Uh, I think one of the things we need to maybe do, I feel like Muslims are really isolated in the world. We are not part of the communication as part of the whole uh, world. I see in the West, for example, the Buddhists, the monks and scientists, they come together and they, they discuss all this issue we discuss. But I can't see any uh, Muslim people, you know, they are invited or they are part of this kind of discussions. Maybe we, when we discuss these issues, we look at from the existential point of view. And then if we can do that, then we have a common language, then we can actually communicate with the other part of the world. I think this is really important because we, I think we are studying all these issues to understand what are the problems. And then from this, then we are trying to make, bring good to the human beings, to the world. But it seems we are going in a way that we, we are kind of isolated because maybe we use too much uh, the language we use is or theological language and uh, uh, it, it's different and people don't have any interest anymore. Sometimes I have discussions, these kind of things with my colleagues at work. As soon as you talk about God, religion, they just, they just don't want to talk about it. They are very sensitive. Maybe we need to use more secular uh, language so that people can relate. The other thing I would like to mention, I think those the issues we've discussed today, I missed some of it, is more about the understanding of self. The other day I was watching a, a YouTube video uh, from Skidar University, which was about the uh, psychology of self. The issue Hanım actually, she was explaining the self in a more existential way related to my life as well. I think this is really important because I tried to read even Arabic, for example, for a while. It was kind of impossible to relate sometimes. The language is more difficult. It's, uh, you know, it's been written for a long time. No one actually uh, translated in many, maybe years. It is so difficult to relate and understand. But I think if, if you kind of try to achieve a common language, we can relate with Christians, non-believers, uh, et cetera, et cetera, then we, we won't be isolated in this world. I think Muslim people, you know, we are not part of the community anymore. They see us as a problem. You know, we need to find a way to come together with these people and then we need to contribute. That's all I want to say, actually. Thank you very much. So, so thank you for that comment. Uh, I, I agree with you. I just need to um, uh, say a few points uh, very quickly. One is that, uh, you know, the fault is really on us. Uh, Muslims scholars have not um, dived into these, um, you know, hard questions, right? Um, you know, Muslims students, when they uh, go after PhDs, um, you know, they go after um, topics that is easier to explore, is easier to write, and it's easier to get a job at later on. And, you know, present that they are an expert on that. So the work that Christian, I'm sorry, there's a lot of um, background, I don't know who's, who's it is. Um, so th the amount of work that has been done on the Christian sides uh, and, and the Jewish side is not even comparable. Uh, we haven't done any work. You know, I get, I have one book out about this and I get so many requests from universities. Um, you know, in the U.S. And, and in Europe to go talk. And I was invited to go to Germany, like I said, back in February. There was a, a dialogue. Um, I don't know whose, whose microphone is open. There's a lot of background noise. Um, and there was, there was, the dialogue was between um, Judy Christian, Christian, um, Christian traditions and Muslim tradition. And they had invited uh, top-notch professors and philosophers um, you know from the Jewish and Christian sides 
Um, and they invited me to go and have that debate with that top-notch philosopher of Judaism, even though I'm not a philosopher, right? But because I had written about this and I was able to go there and three days in a, in a close conference, we were uh, debating uh, back in February, right before this COVID happened, right? And the, what we realized there was that the chair of the conference, University of Erlangen in, in Germany, he was saying that he has a difficult time inviting uh, Muslim scholars to these conferences because uh, Muslim scholars don't really have the specialty, right? So to your point, um, yes, we do need to be involved in uh, discussions, not in isolation, but we have to do the work, right, first, to be able to present and get in dialogue uh, with them from the secular understanding. Um, you also mentioned something about Ibn Arabi, and, and you're right, Ibn Arabi is the theoretical framework of the mystical Islam, right? If you are interested in understanding more Ibn Arabi in a more modern language, uh, I would highly recommend reading uh, the books of uh, Professor William Chittick, right? He is the uh, expert, you, you may all know him, but he's the mm -hmm. expert in English language on Ibn Arabi. Um, but I think Ibn Arabi has a lot to offer because as you know, you know, understanding the existential portion of this issue needs the theoretical background, right? Needs the framework. So as a scholar, you know, I cannot go to a conference and present only on the existential if I don't have a good background on the theoretical understanding. Always, always, anything that we do, both practical and theoretical has to go hand in hand. The framework has to be built before the existential can be uh, made meaningful and fruitful to the conversation. But I, wholly, I totally agree with you. We need to get involved. We need to become more of, of a face uh, with the Christians but, but, and with the Jews. There's a lot of work that has been done on the side of Judeo-Christian traditions. I just mentioned John Hick, uh, a few other ones, but there are, there's a lot of work. I, this library I have here, I have, I don't know, maybe 300 books on just the work that they have done on problem of evil. Great, great discussions. But where are the Muslims? Where are the Muslim scholars, right? None of, no, I have none. I don't see anything, right? The last book on theodicy is from uh, Ayatollah Mutahari, uh, back written in the 70s in Iran from a Shi'i perspective, right? So again, this is a topic that really hasn't been explored. It's a difficult topic, but I agree with you. We need to be out there and we need to be able to get into interfaith conversation about theodicy because it's much needed conversation. But thank you for that comment. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is the final question by Dr. Nejati. I, am, I just came in, sorry for that. I was in Kashmir. There was a conference, just I have a quick flight, then now I'm back. I just, uh, I can catch up at the end, okay? Thank Masha you. MashaAllah, the, the, the flight uh, you caught must have gone with the <laughs> speed of light. Yes, yes You just finished your uh, webinar over there, right? Yes, yes, for three and a half hours. MashaAllah. Okay, I think, I don't know, Najati, he left the, uh, I don't see him anymore. I, I saw he raised his hand, he wanted to ask some question. But, uh, well, in any case, I think we can stop here because we are over uh, two hours already. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nestin Rosati. It was very nice very good comprehensive uh, se seminar i think we all benefited i am sure from this i just have just very short uh, a few words uh, uh, on uh, the same issue uh, number one uh, you know those people who you know lose their faith because they cannot find an answer for this question of evil you know the uh, the problem over there is the what we call uh, misleading of uh, 
Satan, which is the source of evil, actually, for many people, uh, you know, the misleading is that, okay, you leave and you go to the other side, you find the answer over there, or do you fall into another trap and start struggling in the darkness? So this is, this is one thing, you know, that they make a very big mistake. As if, okay, I reject faith, so you reject it, that means you solve the problem. So this is, uh, this is what uh, I would like to say, you know, this is something that uh, they uh, leave behind. And it is actually a uh, faculty of, uh, you know, in mysticism, they're a very good thing. They say in mysticism, this is the misleading of the faculty of fantasy, wahm, in other words, that uh, starts covering all other in, uh, faculties and then they cannot see the truth anymore. So this is something that should be considered in this respect, I think. And on the other hand, that we should also realize that this is an issue which cannot be solved conclusively. That, you know, I give rational proof that finished. You cannot do that. So sufficient satisfaction, namely it none, concerning God's goodness should be convincing enough for us on the basis of trust in God's mercy. This is my conclusion. One more thing I would like to say, you know, in Turkish, uh, there is a, a saying, it has become proverbial, but actually it is uh, written in the form of a poem by a mystic who is Ibrahim Hakkı Erzurumi. I wish, uh, if I could think about this, I should have translated his poem and then read. The, it's very long, though. Maybe in short, uh, uh, I will read very slowly. More or less, I'm sure you will be able to follow in Turkish. Just the first and the last lines, okay? That he says, Hak şerleri hayır eyler, zan etmeki gayr eyler. Arif anı seyir eyler, Mevla görelim neyler, neylerse güzel eyler. So this, uh, I will translate only the last, the last one. Wallahi, this is the final one that after he explains, in fact, he gives answers to the mutekellimun, you know, all many other things with all its respects that he says. And then this is the final one he says, Wallahi güzel et etmiş billahi güzel etmiş hallahi güzel etmiş allah görelim netmiş netmişse güzel etmiş more or less güzel means hayır here so wallahi he made hayır billahi he made hayır tallahi he made hayır and whatever allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done he must have done goodness so this has become you know proverbial in turkish also it's a very long poem uh, that should be analyzed, really. This is also very good. So I just wanted to bring this to everybody's attention. And then uh, if any final words, Dr. Nasrin, then we can uh, finalize today's webinar. Yeah. No, thank you very much for uh, <clears throat> the opportunity for this invitation. It was great to be with uh, <clears throat> all of you today. Again, as, as we said through our presentation and through the uh, fruitful conversation we had with all of you, the questions and great comments. It's, uh, it's one thing to talk about this issue from a theological, from the philosophical perspective. It's another thing to really think about the existential um, aspects of, of this issue. And so, uh, again, my hope is that as literature moves on, especially in the Muslim and uh, Theodosian um, endeavor, we see more work, you know, done on the existential aspect of this as I know uh, that the younger generations are really lost and they really do need some guidance from all of us and uh, hopefully we will be able to fulfill our responsibilities towards ourselves as well as towards uh, the society. Thanks so much. Inshallah. Thank you very much and thank, thank you. you for everybody for participating. As you know this is the last uh, webinar in series. Inshallah. We, will, we are planning to resume after mid-September, 
and around that time I know Dr. Hakan will uh, circulate the announcement uh, and in fact we should make a good planning maybe for the whole fall semester uh, regularly and then so everybody can know and then follow up the coming upcoming uh, webinars so if Hakan wants to say anything concerning that otherwise we can stop here so thank you very much and also I would like to mention that uh, we will have our uh, past recordings on our website at the uh, YouTube channel. So I just put the link on the chat so you can just go and uh, subscribe it to see the past recordings. Uh, so we will plan uh, another uh, semester uh, webinar series. So if you have a topic or if you want to present something, just uh, connect us and then we will put you in our schedule. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Good, bye -bye. Uh, day for everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Ali, merhaba, Salih.